Hi, welcome to Mission Control Center here in Houston where we have uh, Mario Runco with us, one of our astronauts who also uh, works with a bunch of different projects here on the ground as well, including he's been real involved lately with the Transit of Venus uh, experience that uh, just took place earlier this week, and I think you all learned a little bit about it. But before we get started with your questions, um, we're here in the Mission Control Center. The, this is the International Space Station Flight Control Room, and uh, this is where all the people who control the space station from the ground sit and work. I mean, you can probably see in the background the map that tracks the International Space Station, and around the room we've got all the different uh, positions that actually control the systems on board. So we uh, look forward to hearing your questions. I'm Marvin. Uh, I was wondering, could you, would it be possible to send a rover to fix one of the rovers that got crashed? On, I presume, uh, Marvin, you uh, mean on Mars, and <clears throat> at the current time, present technology would probably not permit that in terms of, uh, of being able to, to, to do that sort of repair. It might not be cost effective to do so, whereas uh, sending another uh, rover to replace it would, might be a better option than to repair one that is there. Having said that, if the repair is simple enough, and we did send another rover for more experimentation and more exploration, uh, it, it, it probably would be in a different area. But if it were in the same area and the, and the repair were simple enough, something like pulling out a, a part and replacing it that might be plug-in, uh, then it, then it, I, I would say it would, might be possible. Maybe y'all have heard about the Curiosity rover that's going to be landing on Mars uh, in August and won't be going to get the other rover, but hopefully we'll find out some cool new stuff from it. Do you want us to ask questions now or do you want to speak for a little bit and then have us ask questions? Please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, let's give the students uh, time to uh, all ask their questions. Hi, this is Garrett. I was wondering if, like, if you have plants up there and, like, if you can, like, make them grow really big. Well, Garrett, you have asked a question that is uh, very basic to science. That is a super question. As a matter of fact, uh, we have been experimenting with plants in space for quite some time. Uh, we used to do on the space shuttle uh, plant experiments, but the, the drawback to doing them on the space shuttle was the space shuttle only stayed in space for about 14 days. And as you probably know, 14 days is not a long time to grow a plant. However, on the International Space Station, we do have uh, additional experiments with plant growth. And a lot of the uh, curiosity as to the plants uh, and how they behave in microgravity are related to, is since there's no up or down, which way will they grow? Uh, how do they respond to light? Do they respond to the light differently than, than on the ground? Is there a change in, in, in the plant itself when it is growing? So, and. I would guess, even though we haven't grown a plant very large because we have to stay inside, so essentially any plants we do grow are house plants, and and the house is only so much size, is if I would think because of the lack of gravity, uh, the plants potentially could grow very large. Maybe y'all have uh, heard about uh, the blog that uh, one of the astronauts on the space station is writing right now, Don Pettit. It's, uh, he's written one called The Diary of a Zucchini, and you can find that online at blog, or blogs.nasa.gov. So you might check into that and see what he has to say about the plants he's been growing in space. My name is Ren. My name is Ren, and um, how, how big are those solar panels? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know exact dimensions on the solar panels, but I would say the, the length of them are probably about half a football field long, and they are probably, I would guess, each in width, about 20, 30 feet. Sounds about right. Um, this is Tay and, and has has Opportunity picked up any new information? Actually, Opportunity uh, is, let's see now, uh, help me out here, because we've got uh, Opportunity and uh, Spirit. 
and one of those is not functional at this point in time. I believe it's right. Spirit is I think not, you're right. not op operational. So the twin rovers on Mars have been there for many, many years, well, for several years now, and uh, they have uh, performed better than we have expected because I think the original mission was only like 45, 50 days. They have picked up new information. Both rovers have opportunity, particularly because it's still operational. And that is why we have the, the Mars Science uh, Laboratory, the Curiosity rover, on its way to Mars now in August because of the discoveries uh, that made us even more curious about uh, some of the things we were observing with opportunity on Mars and we're go trying to go and discover those. We found water, uh, we found uh, uh, minerals that uh, are somewhat related to biologics, and so that 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 is a tantalizing uh, elevation of the information that makes us believe that there might have been life on Mars at one point in its history. So to be able to go there and actually discover that uh, would be a fantastic uh, discovery. My name is Trey, and. What do they make the space suits at, space suits out of? Uh, you mean the space suits or the space chutes, as in parachute? I didn't quite understand your question. Suits. Suits. Okay. Uh, the space suits are made of several layers. Okay. The outer layer is uh, basically a, a plastic shell. Uh, on the upper torso and around the the waist, and there is there are metal parts to it as well, and that helps uh, contain the pressure. Now, outside of that, there's a a, a rubber bladder that, that contains the air, or excuse me, inside of that, there's a rubber bladder that contains the air, and outside of that, there's a, a Nomex uh, material that uh, acts as a micrometeoroid, or essentially a protection against uh, the small particles in space so that it doesn't puncture the suit. And, there, and it also has uh, thermal protection on the outside in that same material. There's a blanket, uh, uh, like a, a aluminum colored kind of blanket underneath the, the Nomex that, that is uh, sort of like a radiative barrier that uh, what you might put in your attic. Mario, why do you need the thermal protection on a spacesuit? Oh, good question. The, the thermal protection is such that uh, when you're in orbit around the Earth, uh, most of the time uh, you go behind the Earth, away from the sun, in the shadow of the Earth. Uh, so that would be an eclipse to the person who's doing the spacewalk uh, because this, the Earth blocks the sun. And when you're on the backside of the Earth, you don't have any of the sunlight, and it gets very, very cold, down to minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit or thereabouts. And then when you're in the sun, the temperature rises to about that much, to a plus 250. So you've got a f four to 500 degree temperature range with which you're dealing. And the human beings and creatures on Earth like to stay around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So to keep us comfortable and alive, you need to have the thermal protection. Okay, my name is Courtney. And what kind of food do you guys eat on the space station and how do you eat it? Okay, what kind of food? There's a variety of different kinds of foods. Uh, uh, there's there's a, a limited variety of fresh foods when a spacecraft first gets up and docks with the space station. There's there's treats on board, if you will. There might be some fresh fruits, some some uh, fresh cookies, things like that so that you're uh, familiar with. Uh, the the other food is it comes in a kind of varieties. There's uh, rehydratable foods. Uh, you might know them as freeze-dried. They're not exactly freeze-dried, but the water is removed from them, and then we have to add the water back in, heat them up, uh, and, and they come in lots of varieties, uh, uh, turkey tetrazzini, uh, 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 there's chicken soups, there's uh, burgers and stuff like that. So, and then there's another variety uh, that comes uh, from the military, if you will. They're the meals ready to eat, the same uh, food that the the troops and, the, and uh, would use in the field uh, when they are on bivouac, if you will. Uh, and those foods are thermostabilized, they're put in pouches, and they, they come in a variety of different flavors. Now, the thing about the foods is each astronaut generally samples the menu, they pick what they like, uh, and of course you're not going to eat things you don't like, except there's a little part of the story here. And uh, you, know, you prepare your menus and you plan your menus ahead for the time you're going to be on board. So generally, the food is, are, are, are things that you generally like. However, uh, because of nutritional factors, uh, 
they'll look at your menu and what you've picked. And if you're deficient in something over the long term, uh, potassium or uh, vitamin E or whatever it might be, they will recommend and add to your diet uh, things that will contain those, those nutrients for you. And of course, you'll pick uh, the ones that you prefer the most for uh, that contain those, those nutrients. I heard that you can't or you don't get to eat a whole lot of bread on in space. Is that right? Well, bread in space is, is problematic. First of all, <clears throat> bread has a short uh, shelf life and uh, it gets very dry. For some reason or other, it doesn't last even as long uh, as it does down here if you just left it on, on, uh, on the counter or in the bread box. Uh, what we prefer in space is the alternative to bread are tortillas because uh, two reasons. One is they seem to keep longer and they're not as flaky. When you have bread, it tends to crumble and, and it flies all over the place and it gets pretty messy. Whereas, uh, if, for example, if I wanted to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, uh, I could spread the peanut butter on a tortilla and the tortilla is much tougher and holds together better and it will contain and hold the jelly and the peanut butter. So uh, we you prefer tortillas. You don't get any crumbs floating around right, in space, huh? Right, And then we have to be like fish and start eating the crumbs like a fish in a tank eating its food. That sounds fun enough. I'm Marvin, and we watched a short video, and it show it didn't show where they slept. Do they like sleep in beds or just like strap down and float? <laughs> Good question. Uh, actually, on the uh, I'll, I'll talk about how they sleep on the ISS, uh, <clears throat> and then you could extrapolate to other vehicles like the space shuttle or smaller vehicles like the Soyuz or even uh, some of the future vehicles like Orion. Uh, each crew member has a sleep station. Think of the sleep station as a phone booth, a large phone booth, a little bit shorter than a phone booth because we're not as tall as the phone booth, and a little bit wider uh, to give more room to turn around in. And each crew member has his personal uh, uh, items in there, pictures of his family, the books he might want to read, uh, his laptop, the videos he might want to watch on his laptop, and things like that. Uh, and inside that compartment, they usually have for, for lack of a better term, it's, it's a sleep restraint or a sleeping bag. And the purpose of the sleeping bag is so that you're not, you're, you're restrained somewhat and you're not floating around, in this case, within the compartment, within the phone booth. And if you're sleeping and you're floating and you're actually floating around and you bump into something, that will wake you up and you don't want that to happen. So generally speaking, most crew members crawl inside the sleep restraint. Uh, zip it up. Uh, like I said, it's not unlike a sleeping bag, and that sleeping bag is is attached to one wall or the other of the uh, of the sleeping compartment of the phone booth, and that's how they sleep. <clears throat> Hi, this is Griffin. Uh, uh, what happens if something goes wrong while an uh, astronaut is out in space working on the space station? Okay, uh, you, that's a that's a good question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you uh, when you say something goes wrong because many things can go wrong. Uh, so what are, what are you thinking right now in terms of something going wrong? A problem with the suit? A problem with the space station? A problem with communications? I mean, there's a lot of things I can answer, but I want to uh, tailor the question to what you're thinking. Well, like. Uh... Like something goes wrong with the suit, like they can't breathe, or some more they or they drift too far away from the space station. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, the suit is designed, at least the uh, US made uh, uh, extravehicular mo mobility units, that we call them EMUs, to go EVA, that's a mouthful of letters, but uh, uh, the suit is designed, uh, it has about eight hours, more or less, depending upon how heavily you breathe and how much work activity you're doing. Uh, of, of oxygen and water. And remember, we talked about the cooling. So the water is there to cool you in the suit. And how that's done, let me get to that for a minute. Uh, we wear a set of uh, long, full-length long johns, if you will, that cover uh, the entire body with the skin. And you might have seen this in the race car industry, where this, this garment is has tubes running through it all over the body. And through those tubes, the water is circulated. And so it's actually cooler water to help uh, remove the heat from the body. Okay, so that's how we stay cool, and and the oxygen and the, and uh, and we use pure oxygen in the suit, and the oxygen is 
is designed to last eight hours. Now, if there's a hole in the suit, depending upon the size of the hole, if the hole gets too big, then I would say all bets are off. But generally speaking, that's a very, very, very low probability. Uh, chances are you might get a hole in the suit, a slit in your glove, a micrometeoroid uh, puncture that would be like a pinhole or, a, or even a, a pencil hole into the suit. If that happens, the, the oxygen system, the, the, the breathing system can supply the oxygen to the suit to keep it pressurized sufficiently uh, to keep you alive and give you enough time to get back inside. If this happens at the end of the EVA where you're low on oxygen, there's a secondary emergency oxygen pack that you can either manually or it will automatically kick in and give you an additional 30 minutes to get back inside. With relation to the tether, we are tethered to the space station. Uh, so, the, and that, that tether is a very, very strong fishing line, if you will, uh, that could bring in uh, quite a big fish. So it will hold us to the station even if we tug on the line. But if it does break, uh, we do have a, um, a, if you will, a jet pack, it's called SAFER, uh, that we could fly ourselves back to the space station. NASA likes to have lots of backup plans for just in case something goes wrong. It wouldn't be fun to float away from the space station or whatever vehicle outside you're, you're outside of. Um, hi, this is Kirsten. I was wondering how many hours of exercise do they have today to keep their muscle? muscles and stuff like that because well I think uh, and I'm not a hundred percent sure because I was a space shuttle astronaut and and the requirements for for exercise for us were a little different than the exercises uh, for the uh, space station crew members they are of course long-term long duration uh, space flyers they fly about uh, six months at a time in space as opposed to two weeks or so uh, so their exercise protocol, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they're exercising for an hour or two every day. Uh, and it's up to the crew member. Sometimes if they're not feeling well, they may not feel like exercising that day. It's, it's okay to skip a day or two now and then, but you really want to get the exercise in pretty regularly and, and not miss it because the, with the lack of gravity, uh, up there, your body isn't loaded, and and just sitting here, and you guys uh, sitting in your classroom there, if that's where you are, uh, your heart is working against gravity to pump blood up to your head, and otherwise all the liquid in your body would go to your feet, and and that that wouldn't be a good thing, and you'd pass out and all of that. But in the long term. Uh, you know, your heart muscle uh, gets weak because it doesn't have to push against that force of gravity, so it's doing less work. Uh, your, your bones are not being loaded by the weight of your body, and so therefore there's something in our bodies that tells our system that to hold uh, calcium in our bones, and that keeps them strong and, 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 and very... Uh, very able to hold the weight of your body up. However, if that goes away, the gravity goes away, and there's no load on your body, there's something inside us to, that says the body shed that calcium, and the bones start to get brittle, like somebody who's elderly and has osteoporosis. So in order to counteract that, we do uh, the exercises and several different protocols to ensure that when we do come back to Earth, uh, we retain our health and are able to function. There's an initial period of time after we come down that uh, there's an adaptive period to readjust to the sudden onset of gravity, but uh, that passes, and it takes a little longer then to get fully adjusted to life back on Earth, but uh, you really need to exercise to be able to do that. We have some cool equipment that they can use to do the exercising, too. I don't know if y'all thought about it, but how do you, like, lift weights like you do here on the ground when there's no weight in microgravity? So we have some machines that let them lift weights and run, even though they're really floating, and uh, exercise back as well. My name is Jay, and how many times have you been up in space? Uh, that's the easiest question I've had uh, today. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I, I've been in space three times. I uh, first flew on uh, mission STS-44 on the shuttle Atlantis, which, by the way, uh, will be now its permanent home is in the Kennedy Space Center uh, for, at the visitor center there. And uh, that was in 1991. My second flight was on the space shuttle Endeavour, who will, which uh, will be in California. And if it's not quite there yet, they will be shipping it to California soon. And that was on mission STS-54 in 1993. And my last mission was also on Endeavour. Uh, it was STS-77 in 1996. So that was long ago, I guess, from your perspective. 
Um, hi, my name is John, and I wanted to know how many robots or rovers do you guys have on the International Space Station other than R2? Okay, other than R2, there's some robots called spheres. They're not exactly autonomous robots, but they're uh, actually... Let me describe it this way. Uh, you've seen uh, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars when he was training to be a, a Jedi Knight with his lightsaber, and there was the little ball floating around, and he was uh, trying to hit the ball and was not successful initially until he got the training from Yoda. Having said that, there are spheres like that on board that uh, are used uh, to for robotic purposes to hold positions to carry things around uh, uh, they are experimental and they're they're really not used for anything practical right now but the hope is that we will be able to do so in the future now if there's other robots besides robonaut I'm not exactly sure there might be probably not what you're thinking of as robots but we have the robotic arms on the outside of the space station that we use to carry big pieces of equipment from one place to another as we're installing things on the space station and there's um, actually three of those there's uh, our big one that we call Canada Arm 2 is, uh, is the main one. And then um, there's a, a, a robotic arm for the Japanese uh, laboratory, Kibo. And um, there's also uh, an, an attachment for the Canada Arm 2. Dexter. Right, Dexter, that uh, is used to, to change out spare parts. And just to clarify, those are robotic arms, but they are controlled by someone inside. It's, it would be like... Uh, my being in this room here, and I would be controlling uh, the arm on a backhoe, if you will, that might be outside the room. And so uh, that's why they call it uh, robotics, because it's remotely controlled. This is Tate, and I was wondering how cold does it, does it g get at night in space? Okay, it, how cold it gets at night in space. Let's talk about inside for the moment. Inside, uh, the, the ISS and, and spacecraft in general is temperature controlled. We have a thermostat just like you have in your house and you set the temperature and hopefully the systems control that. Now when the system breaks, you call the repairman, we have to repair it ourselves in order to maintain the temperature automatically. We like to keep it at around 75 degrees at 50% relative humidity. That's generally a comfortable thing. It might be like 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so, and, and we try to, and the systems on board are designed to be able to do that against the temperature extremes outside, which again, range like on the dark side of the Earth. If you're in orbit from Earth, it can get as low as 250, maybe even more. I don't know the exact number, uh, minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit, as, and as high in the sun, on when you come around the sun side, as high as 250. So there's quite a wide temperature range. Now, for probes that go out into the solar system, they are in the sun all the time. So there's a problem with those, at least initially, uh, for keeping them cool, but as they get farther and farther away from the sun, the effects of the sun is, are much less, and they can get very cold. You get to Mars, Mars still is relatively uh, in, in an area away from the sun, in a distance away from the sun that's, that's relatively comfortable. It's cold on Mars, but it can get up to as high as, as, as maybe even 15 degrees on the surface in the summer and the tropics on, on Mars. So it, 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 it can get comfortable for you and I to be on Mars on the surface. However, you go farther past Mars, uh, we have an, uh, a spacecraft on its way to uh, Pluto, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's called the New Horizons spacecraft, and that spacecraft uh, is already past Jupiter and is on, and I think it's a scheduled arrival at Pluto to take pictures of Pluto for the first time directly. Uh, I think it's 2015, and uh, it, uh, out that far, it's very, very cold. I can't tell you the exact number, but it's, it's in that minus 250 or lower range than what I just described. So keeping that spacecraft uh, warm uh, enough for it to function is, is, is quite a challenge. You guys live in South Dakota. It gets very cold there in the winter. It's even a challenge to get your car started in the morning, and that's just right here on Earth. So you can imagine the challenge for sending a spacecraft out that far in that extreme of, of a regime of temperature. Hi, this is Jakota. Um, what kind of school link do you use to be an astronaut? Okay, what kind of schooling? Okay, well... I started out the same way you guys are. I was in classrooms much like yourself, 
and uh, and I was for myself. I was always very inquisitive. I just wanted to learn as much as I could about everything, and you just can't do that. So you have to focus on something uh, to narrow uh, the field a little bit. So I uh, decided after high school, and, and, and well, I decided before high school that I wanted to do something in science and engineering. And when I got to college, I studied, in my case, uh, earth science, physical, oceanography, and, and meteorology. Uh, so that's my particular background. But generically, uh, astronauts uh, mainly have technical, scientific, engineering backgrounds, medical backgrounds, uh, because of the problems with keeping people alive and, and potential medical problems if we go too far away from space and something happens medically. So uh, mostly backgrounds like that, uh, they prefer to have advanced degrees, not required, so that means uh, you, can, you can become an astronaut with a bachelor's degree. But uh, a master's degree is, is desired, and even a, a doctoral, a PhD, uh, is even better. Uh, of course, all of the education uh, is not the final uh, bottom line. Is uh, They also prefer uh, to have people who have some experience, of course, in, in their fields and who are, are, are good or premier in the fields that they've chosen uh, to be in. So, and then that is, that is generally speaking, uh, the, the science, engineering astronauts. There is also the other side of the coin where you have pilot astronauts who generally, uh, for example, fly the spacecraft and in in just recently a retired space shuttle that would actually uh, fly the shuttle to the landing that, uh, or would fly the capsule down to the, the ground or take over automatic control in the event of a malfunction on a computer that were, were the, uh, was on autopilot. So you do need to have uh, the pilot end of things in here. And the pilots are generally from uh, military backgrounds. Not always. Neil Armstrong was not a military pilot. He was a test pilot, but not a military test pilot. But generally speaking, where you get that kind of uh, flying experience is in the military in high-performance aircraft. And you have to have thousands of hours doing that as well. Okay, I think that's actually all the uh, questions we're going to have time for this time around, but we really enjoyed talking with you, and I hope you had fun as well. Thanks so much, and this is Mission Control Houston.